Um, so I'm Phil Nash. Um, some of you may know me from the uh, test framework that I've written, Catch. Um, others, because I now work at JetBrains, I've got a new job. Um, out of interest, how many people here uh, work at JetBrains? So just a, just a handful, so most of you not. So if you didn't put your hand up, you should uh, totally use all of our products. That's, um, that's my sales pitch for, th for the night. So we're going to talk about functional C++. Um, before we do that, actually, talking about my change of job. Previously, I was, uh, I was working at a bank. And I've been doing talks like this for years, and it's never really been relevant to put my company name up on the first slide. Uh, now I can finally do that. And actually, most of what we're going to be talking about tonight is based on work I did in my previous role. So uh, that's ironic, really. I wanted to emphasize that, because when we talk about functional programming, we often get into sort of very academic territory. But uh, I wanted to emphasize that this is all stuff uh, that I've used to good effect um, in real world code, um, mostly in a, in a quant library. So this is the practical application of these techniques. We're not going to get very academic at all. So that's why I chose the title Functional C++ for fun and profit. So let's get started. Um, and actually, I wanted to start just by defining what functional programming actually means, because in order to see how we can do that in C++, we really need to understand that. They may have some preconceived idea of what that actually means already. Um, maybe you're thinking of first class functions, higher order functions, immutability, referential transparency, monads. Now, any of these words definitely all form part of the, the tag cloud around functional programming. They don't actually get to the root of what functional programming is. So to do that, I think we need to consult the authority on the subject, which is the Haskell Wiki, of course. And I want to draw your attention to the uh, first bit here, where it says, functional programming is a style of programming which models computations as the evaluation of expressions. That's interesting. And actually, it's a bit further down the same page, it goes on. In functional programming, programs are executed by evaluating expressions. In contrast with imperative programming, where programs are composed of statements, which change global state when executed. Functional programming typically avoids using mutable state. So there's a few things interesting there. The first thing is it's all about evaluating expressions, expression-oriented programming, if you like. That's really the, the sort of the root node of functional programming. Everything else hangs off that. And you can see it already starts rolling out into um, immutability, global state, uh, that sort of thing. So we'll, we'll drill into that a bit more. But just wanted to emphasize that expression-oriented bit. So in fact, we're going to look at what I'm going to call expression-oriented programming and see how we can, we can start doing that in C++. But remember, we also contrasted it with statements. And in fact, that's, that's where I want to start. What does it mean to use expressions instead of statements? Because we certainly have statements, lots of statements in C++. Uh, if statements, switch statements, um, for and while loops, they're all, all forms of statements. Why is that contrasted with expressions? So let's look at an example. So very simple piece of code. You'll see this in any uh, C++ code base, something similar. All we're trying to do is start a variable off with some initial value that depends on some condition. You see this all the time. And we're doing that by using a statement here, the if statement in this case. And that's getting in the way. It's causing a number of problems in such a small block of code. So just to, um, to highlight those, um, in order to get the value that we want, that we we're evaluating here, out of the if statement, we need to use a side effect by assigning to a mutable value. That also means that we need to have an uninitialized variable up there uh, at the start. Now, we could have initialized that to some default value, but that's not what we actually want it to end up with. We actually want it to be one of these two values, but we've had to make it non-const. Now, even if that variable doesn't change anywhere else in this code beyond this point, it's now mutable. That makes it harder to reason about that code, because in order to know what its value is at any one time, we need to look at all of the code that mentions it, because it could have changed anywhere. Now, the opposite of that is being able to apply local reasoning. 
That means by looking at a bit of code, we can see what's coming in and what's going out and reason about that on its own without having to consider every other part of your code. And that's getting in the way of this as well. So th there's quite a few problems for such a small bit of code. Now, what would that look like if C++ was an expression-oriented language? So this is hypothetical C++. Obviously, you can't do this. Um, but let's see how that cleans things up. Now, this is an ex if expression, which means rather than assigning a value within, the, within a statement, we're just evaluating to a value. So both branches are just values. So we could have had a more complex expression here. It amounts to the same thing. Um, and because the whole if expression evaluates to a value now, we can use that to initialize a variable. And as a bonus, we can also use type inference as well. So we've, we've avoided some extra redundancy. And notice we can make it const. So that solves all of the problems we just talked about. And in fact, if you look at a, uh, a real functional programming language, I've used the example of F-sharp here because that's something I'm familiar with. Uh, it looks very similar to what we just looked at. This is um, an if expression in F-sharp. And apart from the syntactic differences, it's basically identical. But of course, C++ doesn't work that way. We can't do this. You're probably all screaming at me in your heads right now, but we can do that in C++. We see use the ternary operator. And yes, of course, we can do it exactly that way using the ternary operator. So what's the problem with this? Actually, very little. Now, we're often told, you know, we shouldn't use the ternary operator or we should be very careful about using it. And it is true that we can run into to some problems. Um, we have to be very careful about uh, precedence of operators, so we may need to put a few extra brackets in. Um, and it's just not so readable if, if the expressions get complex, and I wouldn't recommend nesting them either. But for simple things like this, I actually think this is a, a really nice way of doing it, because it achieves all of the, um, the positive goals that we, we talked about without any of those side effects. So that, that's one way that we can do expression-oriented programming in C++. Very, very simple example. But actually, the biggest problem with this, of course, is it's just not general enough. It doesn't scale. So if we have more values that we need to, to look at, then we're still going to have to resort to something like a switch statement. We can't, do, can't use the ternary operator here, um, at least not without nesting, which, as I said, gets very unreadable. So we're back to the same problem again. How do we solve it this time? There is actually a solution, and there is actually another way to get values out of a statement without introducing side effects, and that's ironically to introduce another statement. In this case, the return statement. We wrap that whole, uh, the whole statement in a lambda and then return out of it. Then we haven't had to introduce any side effects, and we can use that value coming out to initialize our variable. This solves all our problems, but it might seem like a heavyweight solution. You might think, well, what, you know, why would I go to all that extra trouble just to uh, make this into an expression? But think about it for a moment. Is this actually extra work? This is actually less code than the example uh, without the lambda, mostly because we've taken out the break statements. So it's less code. There's less places that can go wrong. What about the runtime efficiency? Surely it's got to be less efficient because we're doing all this extra function calling. Well, I would expect any decent compiler to optimize that down to close to or basically the same code. Uh, and I actually ran that through the um, disassembler in uh, Visual C++, and it did get identical code out. So there's no runtime overhead as well. In fact, the only downside to this is there may be a slight compile time performance uh, problem, uh, which may be relevant in your code base, or there may not be. But either way, I would seriously consider arranging your code in ways like this in order to make it more reasonable, reduce the, the scope for, for issues that can creep in. And it's a step towards uh, expression-oriented programming in C++. Might look a bit weird at first, but, but give it a chance. So that's if statements and switch statements taken care of. I mentioned loops as well. What can we do about those? Because they have similar, similar problems. Um, but we do already have other alternatives to, to for loops. Uh, we've got the, the standard algorithms. So 
for each doesn't really buy us that much. It's really just another way of writing a for loop. Uh, and these days, a range-based for loop is probably simpler. What you really want to be reaching for are the more specific algorithms. So I've got standard transform, standard accumulate here. Now, these are all examples of higher order functions. So we mentioned that as one of our functional programming terms. Um, what, that, what that means is that these are functions that take other functions or function-like objects or return function objects. And in fact, there's a whole range of them in, um, in the standard library. Uh, I think this is all of them. Um, all the ones at the bottom are the if, if not, and copy if versions. The ones at the top, I've highlighted those because they actually map onto some well-known uh, functional algorithms, map, filter, and reduce. Um, technically accumulate, it's, it's close to reduce, it's more like a left fold, but it's a, it's a minor difference. Um, so these can be very useful, but they do have some limitations as well. They're not really suitable for full-on functional programming. Um, and we'll come back to why they're limited a bit later and what we can do instead. Um, but certainly, using those will often get us out of uh, the problems of using statement-oriented for loops. OK, moving on a little bit, I want to talk about something that I call the builder pattern. And I say I call it that. It's not that I invented the term. Uh, it's just I'm not sure there's a universally agreed on term for this. But I've heard this, this name used in a few places, and it makes sense. Um, it's different to what we might think of as a factory method. Um, in particular, this is a, a static pattern rather than a dynamic one. Um, but what I really mean by that. So we mentioned immutability before. It's a desirable property. So if we try to write our data structures in an immutable way, we're going to be sprinkling const everywhere. So unfortunately, C++ is mutable by default. So it's, it's noisy to, to make it immutable. But if we're going to train ourselves to do it, we're going to be putting const everywhere. And because C++ is not transitively um, const, we'll also have to put it to the things we're pointing to when we have pointers. Um, but that's fine. Um, notice also there I've deleted the, um, the default constructor because it's, it's not usually useful to default construct something that you need to set up in a particular state because we can't change it. Um, in this case, that's actually not necessary because of the, uh, the constant, but I think it's worth putting in anyway. Now, how do we then initialize this? Uh, we could write a constructor, but when we're just using simple data types like this, we can now take advantage of uh, member-wise initialization. Now, if you're uncomfortable with this, consider that if you're just using simple data structures separate from um, the functions that operate on them, we actually don't need to worry so much about encapsulation because we're not going to be changing these objects. We don't need to preserve constraints once, they are, um, once they're set up. So we're often going to work with these public data structures, simple, um, simple data, where the order of the, the fields in there can quite readily just serve as a constructor. So we can do it that way. And that's fine. Sometimes it's not quite as simple as that, though. In real-world code, we're looking at something a bit more messy. And even this is a very simplified example uh, based on code that I've, I've definitely had to work with. I uh, just wanted to try and illustrate that in order to get all the bits of data we need to construct our object, we may have to do quite a bit of work beforehand. So we may be building up these um, sort of externalized variables that mirror the structure of uh, the, the class that we want to uh, initialize. So you can see there I've got the um, variables at the top with basically the same names. Um, and you might sort of start struggling with this and thinking, well, if I just made it mutable to start with, if I got rid of the const, then I could just build these structures up as I go and it'd be a lot simpler, wouldn't it? But then we'd lose all the, the advantages of immutable data, uh, particularly that local reasoning property that we talked about. Uh, and plus, there's some concurrency gains that we'll come and talk about later. So we don't want to throw all that um, niceness away, but we don't want to have to deal with this either. So this is where the builder pattern comes in. And all we're really doing is creating a, a parallel mutable version of our immutable type. Um, 
and we can have a, a build method on there that will then produce our immutable object. This might, again, seem like a lot of extra work. Why don't I just use a single type? Well, remember just now, we're, we're already declaring all those extra variables. All we're doing is effectively grouping them here into a, a single data type that we can use collectively. And we get a few advantages from doing that. One of them is that we can add this build method, which makes that a bit nicer. And we then control the way that it gets built. So here, for example, we are actually re returning a, a shared pointer. So we can enforce the, the reference semantics uh, if that's what we want to do. And in use, it's a little bit less code. Uh, so if you're using this a lot more than declaring it, then uh, you get a bit of a win there. But often, um, as I said, the setup code may be more complex than this. And you may even have parts that are um, effectively asynchronous. You've got to do a call out to do some other work and get called back. So just to try and give an example of that, say this contact book is a, it's, it's going to access the database or something. So you're going to ask it to, to retrieve some data and then call you back on a Lambda uh, when it's got that data. So we can start our builder at the top, start populating it. And now we can effectively um, yield out to the async call. And then when they get called back, we can continue populating it. So it actually simplifies the, the build up stages. Uh, notice I've used here the, uh, the generalized Lambda capture in C++14 so that we can actually move that data structure in. That's one of the advantages of having a single structure here instead of a whole collection of variables that would have to individually move in. We can still do it, but this just makes it a bit easier to work with. And really that's all this is, it's, it's a convenience. We're sort of trading off um, pure immutability for just controlling that immutability to a, um, a single data type whose whole purpose is to set up another one. And it, it's that controlling the scope of immutability that's, that's key here. Remember right back at the beginning in the, on the Haskell wiki, it said that functional programming typically avoids mutable state. It doesn't say it always avoids it. In C++, we, we have to embrace it. It's all about controlling where it goes and being able to reason about it. And that's what this gives us. Difficult to really convey that in a couple of slides, but uh, this pattern is something I used very extensively in my previous role. And it really made the whole process of setting these objects up and reasoning about them much easier to do. We have to trust me a bit on that. Um, okay, that's the, that's the lambda. Okay, this is a little bit of an aside. Um, it's actually a continuation of the the builder pattern, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I call this a fast and safe ref counted string. Um, and we'll see why in a moment, but if you've been around in C++ for, for a while, you may remember that uh, standard string was originally designed to allow for internal reference counting. And many early implementations um, uh, did have reference counting. Uh, GCCs did up until quite recently. Um, but there's a couple of problems with that. And those problems stem from the fact that standard string has a mutable interface. You, you can change your standard string. And because of that, with reference counting, um, applying being shared and uh, threads, you have to have some sort of uh, synchronization. And that implies a technique called copy on write, which we often abbreviate to cal, which makes for a nice visual which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Well, I'll just very, very quickly recap just to, to establish a baseline. So we start off with a, with a string, which has a pointer to, to some buffer. When you take a copy of that string, rather than copying the whole string, it's just copying that pointer, incrementing a reference count, um, and so on for additional copies, which is all fine until you make your first mutable call. And at that point, because the underlying buffer now, now, now may be shared across threads. Um, you have to take a copy. So now you unshare the, the one you want to make a copy on, make a mutation on that. That now has a share count of one, and your, your other strings are still shared with a reduced uh, reference count, which is all fine in principle. And, and it does work um, as long as you've got uh, either a lock uh, 
which a lot of the early implementations did, or you're at least using an atomic reference count. Um, but one of the problems with that is to do with performance. Uh, certainly with the lock and even with the atomic, because every time you make a mutable call, you've got to check that uh, atomic ref count. Even calls you didn't intend to be mutable. For example, just referencing a, uh, a character by index, uh, at least the naive implementation, if it's non-const, will, will be a mutable call, even if you're actually changing it. But there, are, there are ways around that, but it's a significant enough problem that um, early implementations didn't perform very well, and so uh, some switched away from this just for that reason alone, I believe. Uh, Visual C++ did for that reason. Um, most of them switched to a, um, a small buffer optimization version. Um, and the other problem is actually to do with invalidating references. Because this copying happens non-deterministically, behind the scenes, um, any operation could potentially um, make that happen then you may have references or iterators into a string that you can invalidate by something else actually taking a copy, which is very non-intuitive. The original version of the standard actually allowed for this, even though it wasn't particularly desirable, but C++11 uh, plugged that in the standard, so it's no longer possible to write a standard conforming standard string that uh, uses copy and write, at least not one that has all of these benefits. So that, that's why GCC eventually switched away as well. So the bottom line is cow actually runs like a dog. So I don't think there's, there are any standard um, versions of standard string now which use it, which is a shame because there are actually some, some nice properties about being able to share strings. Now it turns out that all of those problems are purely to do with the immutable interface that Santa string has. So if you start with an immutable string design, then you can get that sharing back. So I started walking through the steps earlier, you take copies, increment the reference count, and that's it. You don't have to worry about the copy and write stage because you can never change these strings because they're immutable. And this is the common theme in functional programming, that by introducing constraints on what you can do, it makes it much simpler to, to reason about things and you would just eliminate whole classes of the problems just by not allowing them to happen in the first place. Seems like a simple thing, but there you go, you get all the benefits of it. Except that there was a reason that standard string had immutable interface. Sometimes you do actually want to change them, especially when you're building up strings in the first place. So how do we do that if we have an immutable string? One approach is to, say, use standard string for the mutable stage and then copy that into any mutable string. But it seems a little bit of a shame to introduce a, this copying, perhaps unnecessarily. Um, also, another thing you can do is, well, I call them string refs in my implementation, just uh, an early uh, implementation, but uh, standard um, C17 is going to introduce this as string view. So it's just a, um, a string type that just has a, uh, it's a non-owning string type, has a pointer to a first character and a size. That can actually point into any string representation, uh, including substrings of an existing string. And quite often that's why we need to mutate strings, just because we want to uh, take substrings from them. So using string rests gets you uh, a long way there. Another advantage of this is if, if you do have standard strings and these immutable strings in your code base, you can actually write code that's agnostic to which one you're using just by taking a string ref or a string view. So that's quite nice. But other times you do actually really need to mutate the strings. So remember I said earlier with the builder pattern, it's all about controlling the parts of your code that can, um, can be mutable uh, with, with a very small limited scope that you don't have to worry about when you're reasoning about the immutable versions. And that's exactly the solution we can use here. So in this case, we have a string builder now the whole purpose of this class is to mutate the underlying representation. So this is not a functional data type, this is something optimized more for C++. So we can do things like pass out pointers to external libraries that are going to write into buffers. Um, so we can uh, see mutate them in place, 
we can truncate them uh, and we can reallocate them too to make them bigger. Um, wh whatever it takes to actually build up our string in the first place, but we're never going to share these. There is actually an internal reference count, but there's no access to it. It's only there so that when we're done, we can detach or move that underlying buffer into our immutable string. Um, I said detach here because I wrote my version pre-C++11 before we had move semantics. Um, nowadays, you just use uh, standard move and R value references to achieve the same thing. Um, and then we effectively transition our, um, our buffer from this immutable world, uh, from immutable world where we're building it up to the purely immutable world of our string that we can then use in the rest of the code base without having to worry about whether it's going to change under our feet. So that, that's really nice. But then later, we may, may need to mutate it again. And we can do the same thing in reverse. We can move from our immutable string, sorry, this one, from our immutable string back to a string builder. And obviously, if the immutable string is now shared, this is the one time, one extra time, that we'll need to consult that reference count to see whether it's shared. And if it is, we'll take the copy, just like in the copy and write case. Um, and if not, we can literally move the buffer. So this has all of the desirable properties of the copy and write version, but almost none of the downsides. So this is the only extra place that we need to uh, worry about the atomic locking. And it's much easier to reason about. And there's, there's no overhead involved here compared to the copy and write version. And that's why I say this is a fast and safe implementation. But again, this is not just theoretical. Not only did I use this in my previous role, but at one point, I decided to test this out. Now, we had thousands or millions of uh, strings and string copies flying around in our system. So I uh, got together some sort of real world test case where I could sort of run a soap test and, uh, and measure the performance of it. And then I changed our immutable string to use something more like uh, a standard string, uh, small buffer optimization, to see what the, um, the, the relative difference would be. Uh, and found that our immutable version was significantly more performant. Um, unfortunately, I don't have uh, the figures to share with you specifically, but, but it was significant enough that we decided to, to keep our implementation. So just to sort of visualize that overall lifetime, because I, I want to emphasize what we're actually doing here. We are very obviously limiting the scope of where we can use mutability to something that we can easily control. And then by default, making the representation immutable and shareable uh, in a way that we can easily reason about. So that's strings. And strings are really just a special case of arrays. So of course, we're going to apply all the same principles to arrays. But unfortunately, arrays tend to have different usage characteristics. Um, particularly, they, they're often much bigger. Um, so when you do have to take a copy, it's much more expensive. Um, and you'll often tend to have to mutate them in place, changing individual uh, elements in the array. So they're not always suitable for the same patterns. But we, we, did, we did use. Uh, arrays modeled on the, on the same way um, with array builders uh, and array views as well. Um, but oftentimes we also need to uh, use other data structures. So in fact, there's a more general principle um, or pattern from the functional programming world called persistent data structures. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about these. And just to be clear, this is not persistence in the sense of databases or, or files. Um, this is where you, you have a, uh, a representation and you want to mutate a copy of it while keeping the old one around. So the old copy is persisting, if you like. Uh, that, that's where the term comes from. And to illustrate what this, how this actually works, to use the simplest possible example, uh, which is a list, specifically a singly linked list. Um, again, I'm sure you know how singly linked lists work, but I'm just very briefly going to recap uh, in this context. So. <coughs> Each uh, node in the list has a pointer to the next node, uh, the tail, uh, where, where the first node is called the head usually. Um, 
And it's important that those pointers only go one way. The reason being, if you want to add an element to the list, then all you need to do is introduce a new node with a pointer to the old head. The important point is that the original list uh, knows nothing about this new element. So you can keep both around. The original one can persist, if you like. So you'll usually have some uh, wrapper type that has the, the initial pointer and maybe a size for constant time access. And of course that works for other immutable operations, such as removing items from the list. Again, we can have a smaller list with the original list unchanged. And we can, um, we can pile up those, those mutations, again, all on separate instances. All of these instances can be kept around, or you can uh, get rid of them when you, when you no longer need them. So there's almost no memory overhead in using these. There's a few downsides, though. First, with a list, if you do need to make any changes further down the list, towards C, the right in this illustration, uh, then you're going to be taking many more copies. Um, and secondly, because of all the, the pointer hopping, there's a big performance hit because of uh, lack of cache locality um, and just the extra steps involved. And a lot of algorithms become um, often linear time. So it's not that suitable for a lot of C++ code bases, but <coughs> can still be worth having around. But that's just to illustrate what a persistent data structure is, why they're useful. It gets more interesting when you arrange them more in a tree structure. So just starting with a very simple binary tree. Again, just to recap, each node has two pointers now. We have to call them the left and the right pointers. Um, and these model associative data structures. So usually with some sort of key or maybe the whole value. Uh, it imposes a, uh, a total ordering. On the, on the structure. So when you introduce a new element, then you can traverse down the tree to find the place that it needs to be slotted into. And you usually have a couple of options as to how you're going to put that in, because you can associate it with the, uh, the node to the left or the node to the right. So let's imagine here we're going to put it in there. Now, when we do write this new node in, we actually need to change the parent node. So if, this, if we want to make this persistent, <coughs> obviously we can't change that in place, so we'll need to take a copy. And because we're rewriting that node, we need to change the pointer in its parent node all the way up to the root. So making changes to a persistent tree has this sort of ripple effect on, on one branch up to the root. But none of the other branches, again, need to know about this. So Again, you effectively have now two copies of your tree. The original one completely preserved, persisting, and the new, one, the new branch mostly sharing the original structure. So this is a simple binary tree, um, which is not suited for, uh, for most uses because the, uh, the branches can, can get very uh, long. The worst case, um, they can end up just like linked lists down the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And it's very easy to get that if you load it up with already sorted data. So we'll usually use um, some means of balancing the branches. And the most popular um, technique for doing that is the red-black tree. Uh, I won't go into the implementation of that, but um, I will say that we, we did write a persistent version of a red-black tree. Uh, it's quite doable. Um, and I actually made a little mistake when I was preparing this slide because I was, I was expecting to have to change the structure slightly to show you the red-black version, but it turns out that it was already balanced. So this looks the same, but this preserves the constraints of the red-black tree. <coughs> um, so there's slightly more copying overhead with a red-black tree because the rebalancing involves changing a few more nodes around. Um, what we found in our implementation was it had about a 10% extra cost in copying nodes. Um, which is not that bad, considering what we got from that, which was we got the um, querying performance, uh, basically the equivalent of the standard set, standard map. But this is now trivially um, suitable for concurrency, because there's only one place that we actually need to, to worry about um, synchronizing, and that's the root node. So if we store one of these in a shared location, then 
we just have a pointer to the root node that we need to change with a new version. And we can actually do that just with an atomic uh, pointer. Um, we used our own version of uh, a shared pointer, but um, standard shared pointer, you, you can now make atomic as well. We could do it that way. Now, we did introduce one other optimization here to um, mitigate the amount of copying involved, um, which may not, may not be worth it in your case, but each of the left and right pointers, uh, we made those uh, our version of shared pointer as well. And as you're traversing down the tree to find a place to put a new node, you keep track of the, the shared count or the sharedness. And as soon as you hit a shared node, then everything under that branch becomes shared. But all the uh, unshared nodes, we can actually mutate in place. So we said that this is a persistent data structure um, and it uh, allows us to, to work immutably. But if that mutability is not visible uh, outside of the operation we're performing, then it's actually acceptable. Because when you, when you first mutate the whole tree, the root node becomes uh, unshared. Any changes we make on that branch, we don't need to take additional copies. So you can actually load up one of these trees um, with, with a lot of data uh, with no additional copying. But from that point on, it's safe. Very similar to what we did with the, with the string builder, except this is automatic. So that's persistent red black trees, which we can use for sets and maps. There's actually an even better way to get associative uh, persistent data structures, um, which we did experiment with, but um, I didn't write an implementation, so I'm not going to talk about it in depth. But uh, you might want to look it up. It's a persistent uh, hash tree, or hash tree, depending on how you, how you pronounce it. Um, and a, uh, a tree, that's T-R-I-E in this case, is just a way of um, writing the, the parts of the key for your structure into um, the nodes that you traverse down. Uh, and with a hash tree, the key is just the, the hash code for, for your value. Um, and what you do is you write sort of four or five bits of that hash in each node. And then when you get to the bottom, there may be a, a linear search, much like a, a hash map or a hash set. And it's actually approaching the efficiency of, of a hash map, but it's trivially made persistent. So it's a, a very useful data structure. So I need to move on because I want to get on to this last section. Um, and this is about a very simple data structure. Uh, you can consider it a container. Um, and it's going to be in uh, C++ 17. It's already available in, in Boost. And that's optional. So optional, so it's very simple. Um, you just use it to represent whether a value exists or not without having to resort to using pointers unnecessarily with all their problems uh, or sentinel values. Uh, we can be very explicit in, in what we're actually doing and how we do it. Um, but in practice, this usage looks very similar to using a pointer. So what are we really gaining here? Because you can easily still dereference an optional without checking it. And then you have most of the same problems. You may trade an access violation for an exception message, but it's still going to crash. So it'd be nicer if we had uh, something safer. Actually, there is one method on uh, standard optional and boost optional that will help, which is the value or method, just allows you to provide a, a default value. So if there's no value, then use this default instead. And, and that's great. So it's, uh, it's useful for a number of use cases, similar to what other languages call the coalescing operator. Uh, C Sharp and Swift have these things. Um, but again, it's not quite general enough, which is a shame because it's actually quite easy to make it a bit more general. We could just write a helper function to do that. So. Here's one I've knocked up, so it takes, uh, takes your optional. Um, and instead of a value, it takes a lambda. Now, the advantage of this is that if your fallback value is expensive to compute, you can do it lazily. You don't have to do it if, if you do have the value. And that could be you know, quite useful sometimes. So in this example, I'm not taking advantage of that. I'm still just returning a constant. But now we've opened the door to lambdas. Obviously, we can do much more expensive computations. So that's nice. Um, but as I say, now we've opened the door to lambdas, 
we can also do it the other way around. So we can call the lambda if we do have a value. So here's an example of doing that. So I've called this function with. Um, you can call it other names as well. Um, so in this case, if we do have a value, we just invoke the lambda, very simple. So in usage down here, we will only uh, print out that value um, if there's a value in our optional. Straightforward enough. But sort of missing an opportunity here, I think. We've got that if statement in there. I think right back to the beginning, when we talked about if statements. Um, if we wanted to make this behave more like an expression, then rather than making this a statement, where the only thing we can really do is have side effects, it'd be nice if we could make this into an expression. So it may, may be more like this. So we need the else part. Um, we have to return something. So we're going to return an optional. In this case, the same type. So now we invoke our lambda if we have the value and then return its result. Otherwise, return an empty optional. And now we can treat the whole thing like an expression at the bottom, which composes a lot more nicely. So that's a good start. We can go further. For example, we don't have to return an optional of the same type. So a little bit more work. We can do something like this, where we can actually use it as a type conversion, converter. Um, now, the reason for the bit at the top is just so that we, um, we always make sure we're returning an optional. So if your lambda returns an optional, we'll use that uh, result. But if it doesn't, then we'll wrap it in an optional. That's an important step we'll see in a moment. Um, and we infer the type of the lambda using decal type. So that's quite nice as well. Now at this point, like I say we, this is very composable, and we can now chain calls to the, to the with function together. So here we've got an inner call um, with our initial variable. Um, we do something with that variable in the lambda if we have one, and then we return that as an optional, which we then pass to the outer uh, call to with. And if that still has a value, we can pass that into the second lambda. So that's quite nice. This is an example of functional composition, but it's not particularly readable. And this is a problem with C++. Functional composition is not well supported in C++. In a real functional language, there are ways to effectively invert the, the flow here so that we can, we can chain or pipeline these function calls nicely. Well, we can't do that in the general case in C++. But we can do something a little bit more specific. So if I change that helper function to the pipe operator, which is an infix operator, everything else unchanged, now that same code looks a lot more readable. Flo flow is a lot nicer and, and more obvious. Now when you're reading this, you can, you can see this as linear code, and you can see what well, we're going we're gonna to do this with the variable, and then we're going to do this with the <laughs> variable. And if we add more operations, it scales quite nicely. We've got our type conversion in there as well. But notice the second one, we're doing something interesting. We're, we're returning an optional. Remember I said that we, we will wrap an optional if it's not already optional, but if we return an optional, we'll use that. And this is important because this now acts as a filter. So we're mapping and we're filtering using this very simple helper function. And in fact, there's an even nicer property about this. And that's that, apart from that filter, there's nothing really about this that's specific to optionals. You can actually apply this same pattern to anything that refers to uh, some contained type, whether that's optional, some sort of container like a vector, even async values. And in fact, this is so general, so universal, that it has a very special name, along with a couple of properties I've uh, brushed under the carpet, but this is actually the core of what we call the monad. That's why this pattern is so important, because it allows us to compose very useful pieces of code without having to worry about all the tricky bits. We can sort of keep off to the side. And to give you an example of what that looks like in an even more general way, 
This is a slide from uh, Eric Niebler's talk on uh, his uh, ranges library, which in certain usages can be considered monadic. And you can see he's used the same operator to compose these chords together. Um, if you haven't seen his talk, by the way, I definitely recommend you go, go away and see that because um, he'll explain how he's written all the rest of the code. But rather than the, the inline lambdas, he's, he's got named functions here, but it's essentially the same thing. So all of these calls are nicely composed together. And you can see the value of this. Now, that uh, chunk call there, just in the middle, chunk free. Uh, by the way, just to show you what the output of this is, he's actually producing a calendar uh, to stand it out. You see there's three columns across? You think how complex it is to lay, lay this out. Well, if you just change that number in the call to chunk there, that will change the number of columns across. That's how composable and sort of nicely isolated these bits of functionality are that you can then compose together nicely. So that's really the value in this. So now you know sort of what a, a monad is. It's worth uh, thinking about what Kevin Henney has to say about them from his talk on functional programming. <coughs> and if you're going to be around a bit later for a drink, then um, you might want to think about mm. that. But to wrap up, so what we talked about, started off talking about expression-oriented programming, why that's really the heart of what functional programming is, how everything else hangs off that, but how we can actually start doing that on the small scale in C++. And then how that applies to uh, local reasoning, why that's important, and how that leads to um, striving for immutability. But the flip side to that is controlling the parts of the code that are necessarily mutable, so we don't throw away all the benefits of C++. And part of that is about builder types, how that allows us to, uh, to control that more easily, including the, the string example. And then persistent data structures allow us to take that even further. And finally, we talked a little bit about uh, monads and how we can apply that to real code. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Um, I'll put a load of references on my site at this uh, URL. So levelofindirection.com slash storage. FCPP, that's for functional C++, uh, refs.html, including various other talks and blog posts on functional programming in C++. So, thank you very much.